Hello, Motivation Family, it's Shade, and I'm so excited that you guys tuned in today. I hope you're ready to take some notes because we have an amazing message prepared for you guys, but I'm not gonna say too much, let's get right into it. All right, so y'all hungry, y'all ready? If you're ready, somebody just shout, I'm ready! All right, let's do this, Luke chapter five, Luke chapter five. We're gonna read verses one through seven in the NLT. The NLT is the New Living Translation. Just in case you don't got good Wi-Fi or you didn't bring your Bible, we'll have it on the screens for you. Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 7. It starts here, it says, One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. And a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Let's look at this one more time. Uh, Jesus is at the seashore. He's at Galilee. He's preaching and people are pressing as he's preaching. And... They're kind of like bombarding him. It's thousands of people following him, and Jesus needs a little bit of space because there's more people. And in verse 2, it says, and so while Jesus was preaching, he noticed two empty boats at the edge of the water. And the fishermen, the guys who were running the boats, um, they got off the boats, and they started washing their nets. And Jesus steps into one. Somebody shout one. He steps into one of the boats. So he steps into one boat, and he leaves the other boat unoccupied. And he begins uh, to talk to the guy who owns the boat, and he says to its owner, push it out into the water. Somebody just shout, push it. Yeah, come on, tell somebody else, say, push it. Y'all know where we're going. Tell them, push it real good. Go ahead, tell them. Today, for a few moments, we're just going to preach from the subject, push it. You could be seated. In the presence of God. Somebody shout, push it one more time. Okay, so here, here's the reality. Today, um, I, I realize there's going to be two groups of people who are listening. And shout out to everybody who's watching online. Good to see y'all. How many? 2.3 million people. Can y'all make some noise for that? I love it. Okay, I'm practicing. So, <laughs> but... Understand, there are two groups of people who are listening right now. There are two groups of people that are hearing this message. Both people are in the same place, but they're listening from a different position. Two people, person you're sitting next to is next to you. They're in the same room, but they're going to hear and receive this message differently. And I want to be clear because... This message really is going to be catered, and, and the primary focus of this message is for those of you who are feeling the pressure of the push. The push means that you're sensing that there's more to your life than this. That there's more that God wants to do in your life and through your life and with your life than what you've experienced up to this point. Now, let me be clear. I'm not talking about material things. I'm not talking about a bigger house. I'm not talking about a better job or more money. I'm not talking about a cuter boo. I'm not, I'm not talking about all of the stuff that we obtain. I'm talking about really that thing that, that God speaks to your inner man, your inner woman. I know we got to be politically correct. So like, eh, you know, but but that, that thing on the inside of you that says there's got to be more than this. There's, there's more purpose in me. There's something empty on the inside of me that I need more of God for. And watch this. This is not suggesting that you don't have God and you're not in relationship with God. There's just a point in your life where you can be in, a, in your walk with God, but still be empty. What do you mean? How can you walk with God and be empty? Because there's a point where you can become complacent. I know you won't say amen in church, but you can be saved and complacent. 
You can be saved and satisfied that I know I'm in a relationship with Jesus and that's good enough for me and I'll die and go to heaven and it's all good. Well, it's not all good because he didn't save you just for you to go to heaven. He saved you so that he could bring you to heaven ultimately and live in eternity with him. But he wants you to live a life of purpose now. Somebody just shout purpose. And so I really want to speak to those who are really understanding that there's more to your life than now. There's, there's something in you, but right now you might be in a place where you feel empty. And I'm not talking about you don't have material things. I'm not talking about your family's bad. I'm not talking about life circumstances are terrible. I'm, I just want to talk to some people who understand what it's like to invest in something, but you don't see the return on your investment. Yeah. That it seems like the more that you're given to a thing or that you're invested or you're involved, it doesn't seem like you're getting back everything. And to the point where sometimes you just feel depleted. Have you ever been there where, where you're the one in relationships that's looking out for everybody and praying for everybody and caring for everybody and trying to keep the family together and trying to keep things in order? But it seems like nobody's helping you keep things in order. You, you, okay, when you get emotional, you do things like this. You start saying, you know what, when you get in your feelings, because we get in our feelings sometimes, you say, you know what, I'm not calling nobody. I'm going to see who calls me. Have you ever been there? And you start trying to do a maintenance check on your own life to see who has you the way you have them. And sometimes when people in opportunities and situations don't respond the way that you would like them to, you find yourself feeling empty. Oh, can we just be honest about this? Because you can come to church and lift your hands and sing and say, preach, Pastor Jay, and still be empty. Yeah. Pastor Ray can sing your favorite song, worship team, can shout, and the band go crazy, and you can shout and jump up and down and sweat like Keith and still, <laughs> and still feel empty. <laughs> what kind of church is this? You can pray. And you can worship, you can read your Bible, but still find yourself in moments feeling empty. And this text, it's, a, it's really about uh, a fishing trip gone bad. You have a professional fisherman by the name of Simon who just finished fishing. Jesus is preaching, just finished fishing. He's a pro who can't produce. He goes out to do what he normally does. He's Usually successful. This is how he makes a living. This is how he takes care of his family. This is his livelihood. If he doesn't know anything else, he knows fishing. He's a fisherman. He, show, he shops at the pro base shop. He's, he's got all the clothes. He's, he's got all the stuff, Joseph. He even has a kayak somewhere. He's, he's got everything he needs. He looks like a fisherman, smells like a fisherman. He even cusses like a fisherman. Oh, you don't believe it, but the Bible says when they were blaming him later on about walking with Jesus, he started cussing people out. He was a real fisherman. But he gets to a point where even in his profession, he has a moment where he's not producing. And in this moment of not producing, he, he's, he's frustrated. He's in a moment where he's looking and going, I, I can't figure this out because I know the weather and I know water. I know water and I know the weather. And because of the weather, I, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how far I'm supposed to go. I know all the right stuff, but I'm not getting what I should get. And he's in a place where he's kind of scratching his head. And he comes back to this seashore. And he's, the Bible says that he's washing his net. Him and another guy, they're both leaving their boats and they start washing their net. Now understand, washing your net signified that you were done means you were finished. Your, your job was done. You're, you're closing shop. You're locking the doors for the day. You're putting the locks on the door. You're bringing the grates down. And now you, you're done. He's done. He's in a place where he's empty. He's in a place where he's done, where he's depleted, where he has nothing left to offer. Watch this. And he expects nothing in return. He's in a place where, where he's empty. He, he, he's in a moment where he finds failure. Has anybody in the room ever been in those moments where you find failure you're trying to figure out the things that you were once confident about? You start questioning, is this me anymore? Should I still be doing this? Should I? I don't know because I. what's going on? Maybe things are changing. Maybe my season's over. Y'all in church, we like saying that. Maybe my season's passed. We like seasons in church. But he's tired. He's mad. He's, he's angry. He's frustrated because he was out all night long. 
And after all of that time, he comes up empty. He doesn't catch anything. So he's about to drop his net and abandon his boat. And I believe there's some people in this room and watching online that are experiencing a fishing expedition in your own life to the point where some things you might have tried or some things that you might have invested in or some stuff that you were connected to, you found yourself in moments where you've come up empty. And even you might, you might be smiling today, but you're suffering in silence to the point where you show up, but you quit. Come on, how many of you have ever been there where you, you, you show up, you're present, but you quit? you present, you're here, but you ain't here. Your mind is somewhere else. Your heart is somewhere else. Your thought is somewhere else. While we can see you and smell you, and we enjoy your cologne and your perfume and your smile and your hug and your high five and the selfie that we took while we were giving away free stuff, all of that said, your mind is still on your bills. Still on some loved ones and past relationships that didn't work, and moments that broke your heart, and business deals, and money that you wasted, and opportunities where you said, maybe I could have made a, a better decision. I want to talk to a few of you because I believe this is an opportunity for maturity. And as I tell you, a growing church is a knowing church. I tell you this, and I live by this, that it's not my responsibility to impress you with preaching. But it's really my responsibility to challenge your perspective. And I think if I can offer you a better perspective today, you can live this thing out when you leave. And you'll start to see life differently. So I'm going to take you on this. And I was thinking about something. I was thinking about those, especially those who are constantly pouring into people. You're pouring into people emotionally. You're pouring into people relationally. You're pouring into people monetarily. When you're always pouring... Sometimes you need something to pour into you. Sometimes you need to be reminded that, because, because here's the truth. Have you ever poured into people and didn't see your investment in them? So you feel like, are you even listening? And is it even worth it? You see Simon here, he's in this place and he's calling it a day. And the thing is, and this is the question that I really want to answer. This is the thought that we're going to leave with peace about. What do I do when I don't get from what I gave to? Oh, we don't talk like this at church. What do I do when I don't get from what I gave to? So this is going to be a challenge for you, and it's going to get good in about three minutes because this is going to be for those who you find yourself fishing now. You find yourself empty and looking and trying to make sure I'm in the right place and I'm tired of being empty handed. The Lord told me to tell you today, it's time to push it. Somebody shout push it. So here's the first thing. How do I know that this is for me? How do I know I'm in a season where God wants me to push it? I'm glad you asked. Here's the first thing. Now, this is truth. 90% of people who take notes when I preach they go to heaven. So you're going to need to write some stuff down. This is a great note taker's message. And for those of you who are in small groups, it's going to be really good on Wednesday. But check this out. The first thing I want you to write down is your problem becomes his platform. Your pro- How do I know I'm going to push this? My problem becomes this platform. Verse 1 says, one day Jesus was preaching at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds pressed on him to listen to him and the word of God. And he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So it's telling us right here that Simon, he's fishing by the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus comes back, Jesus sees Simon and his boat is abandoned. He's washing his nets. Simon is angry. He's mad. He's broke. He has nothing to show. But here's the key. Jesus sees him. Now, see, this is the thing. I know we're new, and I know many of y'all new to church, and you don't know what to do, but we're going to do some classes this year. And one of the classes we're going to do is when to shout. Because here's truth. More than anything you can ever read in the Bible, one of the greatest things you can ever read is that God saw me. Because if God sees you, it doesn't matter who else sees you. Think about this. There's thousands of people pressing Jesus. 
They're trying to get a piece of him, and they're trying to get peace from him. They're pressing him. There's so many people following Jesus that Jesus has to get away. He has to draw away from the crowd to stand on a boat so that he can go and speak to thousands of people. And in the midst of all of this stuff, he sees one man. He sees a man who's empty. He sees a man who's broken. He sees a man who's burdened. He sees a man who's confused. He sees a man who might be judged by his peers. He sees a man whose life is in a moment of shambles. And in spite of everything that's going on, he sees him. And I believe there might be at least 100 people in the room that can just say, God, I thank you because you saw me. You've seen me. Yeah, you've seen me. And you saw me. Watch this. Not when everything was good not when it was when I was ready for the picture and the selfie no you saw me at my lowest does anybody knows that I'm talking about and I'm grateful to God because God didn't wait for Simon to go to church he didn't wait for Simon to pray he didn't wait for Simon to worship he didn't wait for Simon to get his life together he didn't wait for Simon to confess and get baptized no right in the middle of his emptiness and his brokenness he saw him and I believe there's some people in the room who in spite of what you're going through you have to remember that he sees you he sees you he saw Simon he saw him and 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 I want you to see this because because he saw him he's getting ready to have an encounter with him that was gonna change his life And the moment you recognize that God sees you, it puts you in a position to be open for him. I I love this because for every person who's discouraged, who's disappointed, who's going through a moment, who's upset, who's tired, who's overwhelmed, I want you to know today that he sees you. He sees you. Just, Just touch yourself and say, he sees me. And I love it because he sees me and he knows my struggle. He sees me and he knows my pain. He sees me and he knows my emptiness. He sees me and he knows my brokenness. He sees me and he knows my disappointment. He sees me. He knows my frustration. And with all of that, he still gives me grace in my humanity. Watch this. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15 that this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. In other words, it's our weakness and our our issues that draw his attention. The Bible says it's a broken spirit and a contrite heart. God won't despise it. You understand he's attracted to your brokenness? Why? Because there's something about your brokenness that makes you hungry for him. It's something about your brokenness that causes you to be open in a way you weren't open before. It's something about being in a position when you're in need, being in a position when you're in lack that you'll be open for stuff that you once would have rejected. Oh, some of y'all, some of y'all look good today, but you didn't always look this good. Some, some of y'all eating better than you used to. And you know what it's like when you were in lack. You ever been hungry? You ever been hangry? And you were so hungry that you ate stuff that you didn't even like just to fill a need. Okay, the food didn't work. You ever been so lonely being single that you dated somebody you didn't even think was cute? Look straight. They might be here. Just look straight. Just just look at me today. Don't even look at them. Like, I'm here now. (laughs) <laughs> You're like, Pastor, go ahead and blink if it's them. Blink if it's them. I give you a word. Uh, blink if you're next to them. Blink. <laughs> it's church. I shouldn't be smiling. But it's in these moments when we're empty and we're hungry that we're the most open, that we're the most attentive. And that's usually the place where God gets our attention the most. It's when we are depleted. And he steps in, and and I love this because Simon doesn't go unnoticed. While everything else is going on, Jesus sees him. Jesus, he understands that even in spite of it all, Jesus captures every thought. He's concerned about what concerns you. And no matter how big it is or how small it is, it uh, it does not escape his attention. He's looking at the details of Simon's moment, and he sees him. Now, I love this because it was Simon's problem. That positioned Jesus to address it. 
going to get good here. It, it, you know, because Simon was probably frustrated and mad because he's failing. But it was in this failure that he finds faith for his future. And there's many of you that are going to understand this, that he couldn't produce. He's, he's in a moment where he can't produce. He's in lack. But he didn't realize that he was in position for his purpose. So I'm, I, I know that it might look bad and it might seem bad on this side because we're reading it. It's a story that happened. It's a situation that really took place. And it's easy on this side to say, man, oh, that, yeah, God really blessed him. God really used him. But when you're in it, David said it like this. He said, it was good that I was afflicted. If I wasn't afflicted, I would have never known the Lord. But he says all of this after his baby dies. He said all this after his kids have a, a, a war. He says it after he's gone through battles and struggles. He says it after. But the issue is not what happens after. The issue is what is your confession in the middle? What do I do while I'm in the middle of feeling empty and feeling abandoned and feeling like I have nothing left to give? We're looking at this and not understanding he's a human and he's having a human experience. But watch this. It's his problem that creates the platform because now that he's empty, imagine this. If he found all the fish that he was supposed to find and he had success that night, his boat would have never been empty. And if his boat was never empty, he would have never had a place for Jesus to use. And if he never had a place for Jesus to use, he would have never become a disciple of Jesus. So it was his failure that gave faith for the future. What am I trying to tell you? That even in him there's no failure because what you see as failure, he sees as faith for the future. And, and watch this. Oh, God, this is going to get good. And this is where favor finds you. Because favor is not just about what feels good. Favor is about how you, how you live through what feels bad. I know you want to high five your name and say favor when you get the raise and say favor when you walk down the aisle and say favor when you have a baby and say favor because you stuck to your diet plan. You want to shout favor. But is there anybody that can shout favor when you lose your job? Can you shout favor during the breakup? Can you shout favor when you don't want to be single? Oh, Wall, thank you for having my back. Yeah, because favor, watch this. Why is that favor? I'm glad you asked. It's favor because there are other people that lost like you, that were broken like you, that were disturbed like you, that were interrupted just like you, and they didn't make it. Some of them got addicted. Some of them got locked up. Some of them went crazy. Some of them OD'd. But how do I know it's favor? Bump somebody and say, because I'm still here. Yeah, it might have took them out, but it didn't take me out because I have favor. I might have tears in my eyes. I'll cry, but I won't quit because I have favor. Somebody shout favor. I want you to understand this because this favor is not about how I feel. It's about who I know. He creates a platform through my problem. So it's my problem that really demonstrates my favor. Mm. And it's not that Jesus needed his problem, but he did. Jesus don't need my problems, but I need them because that's the place where he positions me. So, so watch this. Jesus doesn't just see in you. He sees for you. So he doesn't just stop and say, I see purpose in you. That's easy. He's God. But he says, I see for you, meaning I see what you can't. And I'll lead you to a place you can't go on your own. I don't want to get too far ahead. But what I've learned is in this moment that he's in, when he's having this problem, Jesus gets on his boat. And now Jesus has a platform to speak to people and, and impact people and change lives from, Peter, uh, from Simon's boat. Which tells me that it was through his failure that created faith opportunities not just for Simon but for others oh God and so what drives Simon out is the very thing that drew Jesus in it was the thing that made him leave his boat 
That was the very thing that attracted Jesus to where he is. And in his omniscience, in his wisdom, in his sovereignty, Jesus knew what Simon was going to go through. Jesus knew what Simon was going to experience. Simon didn't know, but Jesus, somebody just, most of my say, God knew, God knew. And so while he was out all night and found failure, he's mad, he's cussing, he, he's, he's frustrated. Jesus is preparing the platform through his frustration. Can I pause here and say this? That maybe what you're frustrating him right now, if you take another look through the eyes of faith, maybe you'll start to recognize, I'm frustrated, but maybe God's creating a platform. Maybe God's creating space for himself to do what he wouldn't have space to do if I found success where I wanted to find it. So, so my problem becomes... His platform. Here's the second thing, because I know y'all want lunch. Uh, here's the second thing. Write this down. The next act of obedience leads to the next moment of success. If you don't get anything else, you better get this right here. If you miss this, you will miss. If you don't write this down, take a picture. Do something. But this whole message is tied up in this thought. The next act of obedience leads to the next moment of success. Watch what verse 3 says. This is so powerful. Verse 3 says, step it into one of the boats. Somebody shout one. one. Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. Simon does what Jesus asked him to do. And so Jesus, as a result, he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Watch this. In spite of his emotions... In spite of how he felt from being empty, Jesus tells him, push, and he does. Ah, when I was a younger preacher, and anytime you hear this message preached, people love getting to the end of this. The end of this story, let me just give it to you now. The end of the story, Jesus is going to tell them, go into the deep, launch into the deep. They're going to go and get more fish than they ever caught, and everybody's going to be happy, and they're going to dance at the end. That's, that's the story. And when you're a preacher and you're young, you get excited because you want to get to that part. You really preach for that part because that's the part where everybody loves it. You're going to get a house. You're going to get a house. You're going to get a We Oprah. It's Oprah Church. Everybody's excited. And then the band keys up. Mm, and everybody goes crazy. But in maturity, I learned something. That that wasn't the blessing of the message. The real sauce to the message is right here in verse 3. Jesus tells him to push it, and he does. Oh, my God. I, I, it's this first act of obedience that once he pushed for the first time, this is what led him to push again. We keep trying to jump into leaping in faith. But I'm learning, you don't always have to leap. You have to learn how to step. And that's why many people aren't growing forward in faith. Because you're looking at the leap at, I got to get way out there. I got to go deep. Instead of taking the first step. And it's the first step that led him to success with God that he would have never had before. It was his experience by first listening in the small thing that gave him faith for the big thing. And many of us are missing the big thing because we've overlooked the small thing. We did not take the first step of faith. We weren't obedient to the little thing. And we thought it was beneath us. And we thought we should be past that. And we thought we were too old. And we thought we were too good. And we thought, well, I just, you know, this is my title or my position or whatever we thought. So we overlooked the little thing. But it's the little thing that plants the seed for God to add the increase so you can get into the big stuff. The next act of obedience leads to the next moment of success. This is a huge point because what you do next will determine what you get next. And everything you're getting is a result of what you're doing or not. He, he listens. Now understand, this is important because he's speaking to Simon. And many of you may not know this, but Simon is Peter. We know Peter. Peter's the rock. 
He's the, he's the, his name means Petra, so rock. He's the, he's the guy who Jesus gives revelation to. And he says, who do men say I am? Peter's like, you are the son of the living God. He's like, flesh and blood didn't reveal to you. God did. And he tells him that. And, and he's like, word, you know, yeah, I got it. He knows who Jesus is. This is the guy who him and Paul lead the church. This is the guy Jesus, like, really put out front. And, and so everybody knew who Peter was. But before he was Peter was Simon, which means that there was something that God was developing in Simon so that he could later become Peter. Oh my God. There's something God is doing in who you are now for who you'll become next. But until you're obedient, you'll stay Simon. Oh my God, this is going to... You're frustrated... Because you have the vision of Peter, but the life of Simon. Jesus went to Simon and said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Simon was a fisherman. Jesus said, when I change you, you're going to do more than you did before. So he says, Peter, you're going to be a fisher of men. But before I can be Peter, I got to deal with Simon. And Simon had to learn to listen to what God said. And it was somewhere in that place of listening, that place of obedience, where now he begins to change and grow and develop. And maybe the challenge for many of us is we're not experiencing the more because we're not saying yes and no to the right things. <sighs> I want to move off this point because we only got like 12 minutes, but I want to, I want to, I want to, I, I, I got to lean into this. I got to lean in because, because here's the problem. Many of you have been Simon too long. Simon. Simon is a fisherman, not fisher of men. His change had not come yet. Where God was bringing him to, there was more in him, but he hadn't yet been in a position where he could respond to the more of God. So now, through his failure, there's an opportunity for a shift. If you miss your opportunity, you'll miss the shift. Okay, let me, let me, let me clarify this, because I want to make this practical for you. It's easy when you try to fulfill failure with what you want to satisfy you. So because you failed in one area, you now try to satisfy that feeling with your own decisions. And many of us will miss God because we keep putting flesh where faith is supposed to go. So we keep putting faith, we keep putting flesh where faith's supposed to live, and now we're getting the results of flesh, and we're blaming faith. You say you believe God, but you live like you believe you. And the more we trust us, the less room there is for him on our boat. So we're empty-handed. I'm, I'm trying to move. So our next act of obedience leads to the next moment for success. He, he, he pushes out. Jesus is on his boat, and now Jesus impacts the crowd. And when he sees this, doesn't tell us what he thinks, doesn't tell us what he said, but we can see through his actions, we can discern, we can pull from that, that it was something good. And I'm going to prove it to you because here's point number three. Write this down. God is bringing an end to your own efforts. This is where it's going to get personal before we go. God is bringing an end to your own efforts. Watch what verse 4 says. When he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go. He says, now go out to where it is deeper. In other words, he tells him, push it further. Somebody shout, push it. He says, and let down your nets to catch some fish. And Simon says, Master, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But 
if you say so. I'll let the nets down again. It doesn't tell us what Jesus preached. It doesn't tell us his sermon title. It doesn't say if he hooped. Some of you are like, played basketball? No, not that kind of hoop. It doesn't tell us what kind of, uh, you know, what voice he used. It doesn't tell us much. It just says that Jesus preached to the crowd. And when he's done preaching, he tells Simon, he says, now go push out further. If you look at the King James, it says, launch further into the deep. Peter, uh, Simon says, well, we did that already. We, we were up last night. You, you were preaching. You was busy preaching. But while you was preaching to those people in the revival, we were out fishing. We didn't catch anything. We've been there already. We've done that before. He, he tried to put his professional expertise to a person who created the fish and the water. This is why, can I just pause here and say this is why you have to be careful not to listen strictly to people who practice. Peter is a professional fisherman, but he's practicing. Your doctor is a professional doctor, but they're practicing medicine. You have a great lawyer, but they're practicing law. There are some great scientists, but they're practicing scientific theories. So their ability is to respond to what they see, but they can't dictate what they see. They can only respond. This is why the Bible says, whose report will you believe? And the response was, we shall believe the report of the Lord. Why? Because God is not practicing. While they're practicing, God is manipulating and dictating and directing. And so what they see, they can only respond to. But they don't understand that even in what they see, God had a plan. Oh, my God. Can I just tell you this? God had a plan before your problem ever existed. You might be walking into it, but God's not. You might have got caught off guard, but God didn't. He had a plan. He might not have caused your problem, but he allowed your problem, and he'll use your problem to bring you to the place that he wants to bring you. And everybody else can only observe with their education they observe, with their, with, with their profession they can observe, with their experience they can observe. But God is the one. Who can use all things to work for your good and his glory. So we see something here. He says, I want to bring your own efforts to an end. We got to wrap up. Uh, what is he saying? He said, because where I'm taking you, efforts on your own is useless. Mm. It was so important when Peter, or well, when Simon, I keep saying Peter, but Simon was listening to him. He had hesitation at first because this is real. I don't want y'all to think living for God, you just go, yes, and just walk into it. Sometimes you just, uh, you tip your toe in the water. Come on. Some of y'all swim in the summertime. You know what I'm talking about. He just, I ain't jumping. I'm going to just put my toe in. So Peter, Simon puts his toe in. And he says, okay, I, we tried this already. We, we've already experienced. I'm just letting you know, just in case you didn't know, Jesus. We've been here before. But he doesn't stop there. He says, but if you say so. He says, if you say so, I'll do it. Do you understand the power of your obedience to God? Imagine if he said, nah, man, we already tried that. You're late. See, that's the problem. Some of us think God is late. We think God don't know what time it is. Like, uh, you know. Uh. Y'all remember Mary and Martha when Lazarus died? They said they thought he was late. If you had shown up before, and we judged them, but we lived just like them. Jesus, this wouldn't have happened if you shown up before. If you had shown up before. If you had shown up on time, if you did it according to my plan, Jesus, this would have been better. But Jesus wants us to understand this. 
that there's a limitation to our effort. There's a limitation to your education. There's a limitation to your resources. You could be the richest person in the world and still find yourself in a limitation. Because money won't buy you another day on earth. It won't buy you health. You, you got to understand there's a limitation to everything. So he says, watch this. I, I, the only way you can really have a, a true revelation of me is for you to run out of your ability to be successful without me. So I'm going to let you get to your limit and break. I'm going to let you get to this point and feel empty. And once you get to that point, I'm going to give you a revelation that changes the way that you see me. Because the moment you see me as the one who can do what you can't do, you'll put me in the right place. And then everything you desire will be after me. See, the problem is one of the reasons God allows us to run out is because we've put desires before him. That's why when you're in him, the Bible says, I will, God says, I will give you the desires of your heart. Now, we've prayed that wrong for years because we pray for the things we want, thinking God's going to give us what we want. But it's not that he gives you the desires that you want. He gives your heart what to want. So the desire of your heart, he changes your heart so you want different. So when he gives you the desires of your heart, he's telling your heart, you don't want that, you want this. And as that begins to happen, you start putting so much effort thinking it's you and you start relying more on him. This is why prayer becomes more important to you because prayer becomes the secret place. It becomes the secret sauce. Prayer doesn't become religious to you. Prayer doesn't become making God a genie in a bottle and rubbing it and saying, God, give me, give me, give me. No, that's immature and unbiblical. Prayer becomes a thing that you can't. It's like it's like having a long day at work you can't wait to get home hopefully get in the shower and then get in your bed that's been waiting for you all day prayers like going home and I just can't wait to be in his presence I can't wait to hear what he has to say I can't wait because there's something secret and special and unique when I'm in that place with him and in that place of prayer, I don't rely on my own effort. I don't even care about what I want because what he wants starts coming out of my mouth. What he wants starts flowing through my spirit. There's something that's satisfying when I'm in his presence in a personal way. But I never get there when I'm successful in my own efforts. So he'll allow me to go through seasons and moments where I begin to desire him in a different way. Can I go just a little bit deeper before we go? So, so watch this. So now he's in this place where his effort left him empty. And Jesus tells him, now push further. Because where you were, you were empty. But where I'm taking you to is going to help you Get what you couldn't have got without me, which means that the timing or the calling of God without the timing of God will always lead to the absence of God. That means I can't just go out because I want to do it. I got to go out when he says do it. It's all about timing. It's all about timing. Timing is everything. You could be in the right place at the wrong time. And go after stuff that's for you in the future. But you're too immature and inexperienced and hard-headed to maintain what you've obtained. And so now, watch this. Because of that and immaturity, we spend the next 10 years praying to retain something that we couldn't maintain. That if I had just trusted his timing, if I had just trusted his push, if I had just entrusted his instruction, maybe I would have seen the fruit of success with him rather than living in the failure of my flesh. It's too deep. Let me move forward. So for 2024 to really be louder for you, you're going to have to 
push past the limitations of 2023. And that means there's some stuff that for yourself you're going to have to even get over. He didn't get stuck there. He said, I tried it before, but if you say go. Which means that there might be some stuff that God calls you to that you failed at before. There might be some stuff that he says, try again. But this time you're going with my direction. It's the same direction, different instructor. Oh, my God. And who your teacher is matters. The Bible says in Galatians 5.16, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. What he's telling us is this is why we need a word from God and we need to be led. Because when we lead ourselves, we'll find ourselves. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man. But the end of that way leads to death and destruction. So when I don't lean to my own understanding, I can put him in a position where I hear his voice and find the success that I need. Is this good to anybody? I love it. Okay, let's give me, let me give you this last one. and We got to go. We're two minutes past. Uh, here's number four. Write this down. We're going to go home. God will give you weight for your weight. God will give you weight for your weight. In verse 6, watch what it says. Jesus tells him, he says, go push further. He's like, all right, Jesus, you said it, I'll do it. He pushes out further, and it says, and this time. Somebody shout this time. Oh, I love it. This time their nets were so full, so full of fish that the nets began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners. Remember, I told you at the beginning how many boats were there. Y'all, slow but worth waiting for. How many boats were there? Okay, good. There were two boats. Jesus gets in Simon's boat. Now, I was thinking, how come Jesus gets in one boat and not the other? What made him choose one over the other? Y'all ready for this? Purpose. That's all. It wasn't that he didn't have purpose or plans for the other boat. He just had a different timing of how he was going to use the other boat. This is important because when Simon says yes, he goes out further, experiences success to the point where he couldn't control it. He had so much success that it was getting ready to tear his nets. And it was so heavy that his boat couldn't handle it and more were still coming. So he said, I need help. The other empty boat, the other boat that failed too, was getting ready to be used in the same way at a different time. This is why you have to be careful two-sided. Number one, that you don't prematurely judge incorrectly. Just because how you see God using one person does not mean God does not have a plan for you. Oh, my God. And many of us think that because God's using someone that way, he must be with them and not with me. God has plans for your boat. You might be empty for a season. It might seem like God's breathing on them and doing this through them. We're in the same business. How come they're successful and I'm not? Because it's not your time. There was something that God was doing and developing in Simon that had nothing to do with the other person in the other boat. We don't even know their name. Oh, my God. And some of y'all too focused on people you don't even know their names either. You won't say yes to God because you're sitting there waiting for God to approve other people. But you got to walk in the approval of God for your own life. If, okay, 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 okay. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. But I got to say this, and I promise I'm going to say it's going to be worth it. Stop living for the applause of the crowd. Because I'm sure the other boat was not celebrating him. Like, oh, word, God's about to use you. All right, man, call me when you get back. I can imagine. He's like, dang, Jesus, if you're really a prophet, 
you would know I need help too. Jesus, why? What is it about me that made you choose them? Have you ever been there? What is it about me that made you reject me and choose them? You start asking yourself a whole bunch of questions, because I've been there. I've been there. I've been in those seasons and those moments where I'm looking at other people going, man, I'm not saying I'm the greatest preacher, but I see some preachers and I'm like, I'm like, God, but, but at least I use my Bible. <laughs> That's just saying this, this moments where you start going, God, you start questioning what you used to be convinced about when your boat stays empty. But it says that once Simon obeyed, and, and let me say this to you too, you never know what your obedience will impact in the future. By you saying yes to God can change your family. Amen. You don't know what your yes is going to do for the next generation. This is why you got to show up. Watch this. Because of Simon's de decision to follow Jesus and say yes, he now has what they call sinking success. His success was so heavy and so big that he needed to find people. And the only people that he could use were not other successful people. It was others, watch this, who were just like him. Come here, empty boat. And this boat starts experiencing the same level of success that Simon did because of Simon's yes and their opportunity to be empty. This is why you have to understand your season, because if you keep trying to fill your things, your, your life, with things that will only satisfy you momentarily, you won't be ready for the increase. You waiting for God to send you a man or send you a woman, but because you don't want to be lonely, you're dating fools. And now, watch this. So now the person that wants to marry you is not even interested because they're looking at your choices. Oh, my God. Y'all just. If you had just stayed available, there would be an opportunity. Just bump somebody and say, don't settle. Go ahead and tell them. You settling. You settling. You settling. There's, God will give you weight for your weight because they waited on the Lord. Watch this. Now God blesses him with more than he can handle. Do you understand the more that you become patient and wait for God and trust him? Waiting really just means trusting. The more that you trust, the Bible says those that wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength. You got to understand that waiting, that trusting, the, the longer you wait, watch this, and the more faithful you are in waiting is the evidence of the level of your trusting. I'm not moving from this spot because I know God is on the way. The moment you move, that's the level of your faith. That's the level of your trust. But because I'm not moving, it means I know he's on his way. Stop trying to fulfill legitimate needs with temporary circumstances. You, 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 you dealing with things that are temporary to try to fulfill legitimate needs. Not everything you desire is bad. It just may not be time. Hmm. There's something that God releases in your life that only comes when you're waiting. And this whole message, this whole situation is not Really, I, I, want, I want you to catch this and we're done. It's not focus on what you're getting. I don't want you to sit and just think getting, getting, getting. Because that's the mindset that we have as Christians today. 
Everything about God is I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to get. And God's going to do, and God's going to do, and God's going to do. But here's the thing. This is really an under, This is really to give understanding that there are some things that God will release to me and some things God will call me into when I stand willfully and patiently waiting on his instructions. And I have to be open enough to trust the outcome versus what I want right now. Because if I can be vulnerable and honest, and we're going to pray, there were times that this we wouldn't even be in this position. And I mean in a good way. We wouldn't even have a church if I gave in to my feelings. Do you know how many times as a pastor I quit? Y'all didn't know this. There was time I'm preaching, but I quit. I'll be home. I tell my wife, I'm done. I'm done. Babe, this is, this is my last week preaching. I'm going to just get through this stupid message. <laughs> get through this dumb message. I'm done. Yo, let's look for houses here. How much do you think we can get for our house? I'm done, done. Looking up schools. Setting up appointments that I'm not even going to. How's the school district down there? I'm making, setting appointments in my date book and everything because I'm feeling away. Right? And, and, and here's the thing. Because there are times where I saw the success of other people, what I thought was success, and felt like, well, maybe we're growing too slow. Because if God was really in my boat, but you know what I learned? Some things that I thought was failure, God was producing faith in me. And, and watch this, protecting you and me. Y'all ain't ready for this. This is too much. This is, this is too much. Watch this. Because some people I might not have been ready for. I might not have been ready to pastor some people. Because y'all got issues. Not you, your neighbor. Just bump him, say he's talking about you. Go ahead and tell him he's talking about you. Not you, you, yeah. Y'all got problems. All the different colors in here. Y'all got problems. Y'all got some issues. <laughs> Do you know what it's like pastoring you? You don't even know me, Pastor Jay. I seen your Facebook. I seen it. I seen your IG. I'll be seeing. Everybody's going to private right now. <laughs> what kind of church? I know who I pastor. Imagine what it was like if you had to pastor you. Here's what I'm saying. Because I'm the problem too. I got issues. That's why we get along. But watch this. Here's what I'm saying to you. Here's what I'm saying. Because there's moments if, if you don't process this properly. This is why I said it's a call to maturity then you'll beg for seasons and things God has for you that you're not ready for. I thank God we had over 800 people show up last week. It was amazing. We're in two services now, and this building's too small. Look around. We, we, we let out the church, and we still are packed. And this is just week one. By fall, we'll probably be in another service. And we need another building, which means we need more of y'all to serve. But anyway, we get there. Here's what I'm saying. But I'm saying this to say this to you. I'm saying this to say this, though. So there were seasons where God had to mature me for where he's taking me. There are seasons God had to mature you for where he's taking you. But if you quit prematurely because you have a season of emptiness and you abandon the boat, think about how many people wouldn't have come to Jesus if motivation didn't exist. If we had given up, how many people's lives wouldn't have been changed and impacted? And how many people would have gave up on God? And how many people would be drunk right now and high right now or higher? And how many people would be more confused? Did I, did I, say, did I say that all out I smelt you when you came in. It's all right. God's still working on you. He's working. He's working on you. <laughs> It's not me, it's the Uber, it's the Uber. 
<laughs> We're having too much fun. Okay, here's the thing, though. <laughs> y'all too silly. This is church, y'all. We're supposed to be saved. But imagine, imagine us not having an impact on the community if we responded to our emotions. I'm only saying all this to say this to you. It's your season to push it. Wherever you feel empty, push harder. Wherever you feel resistance, push. And listen for God. I'm not talking about your own efforts. I'm not talking about your own ideas and just keep trying to strategize. Because that's what I did. I would try to strategize. I had all these, I'm creative, so I'm, I'll be up all night going. And God's like, oh, that's good. Dap me up. I feel like God's with me. He's like, I didn't say go. I didn't say now. It's not the season for that. So you got to understand the season that you're in so that God, when he breathes on what you have, man, it's such a blessing. It's easy when God's directing it. And what I mean easy, it it has challenges. It's easy because I'm not sitting here trying to figure it out. I'm just following the cloud. Remember I told you we're coming into this year and we're following the cloud, following where he's directing us. And in your own lives, you have to learn how to follow the cloud cloud. He was a cloud by day and he was fire by night. He led Israel through the wilderness to the promised land. When you follow the cloud, when you follow his presence, there'll be things that you can avoid following his presence. There'll be things, blessings that you walk into that you didn't even recognize were on the way or were on that path. So there's so much God has for us, but here it is. We have to push. That means we're going to have some moments where we fail. But don't quit. And don't throw in the towel. And don't give up on God. And don't say this faith thing doesn't work because it didn't work when you wanted it to, how you wanted it to. Maybe God's just creating an opportunity through your failure. So you'll start seeing failure differently. All right, that didn't work. God, what's next? Because there is a next. We got to go. But next might not be now. Because in your moment of emptiness, he's maturing you for where he's taking you. Now, didn't I tell you that was going to be amazing? I hope you took your notes. And if you want to sow a seed in Motivation Church, the giving options are below. We are doing amazing things, and we would love for you to be a part of it. Now, make sure you try to get in the building for our 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. services. We are so excited, and we can't wait to see you there.